Well, good evening. Um, I just want to say thank you to the church for allowing me to do this uh, four-week little mini gems from John. Um, my gift, I believe, is pastor was talking this morning about do you know what your gift is? Do you know what God's called you to in the church? And I truly believe my gift is teaching. And I would be derelict if I didn't do that. So um, I really enjoy teaching. Uh, it's just, that's me. Tonight we're going to look at Mary Magdalene and the Apostle John. Um, real focus verse though, or not a verse, but yeah, it is actually. Uh, in my, love, my life, thou art greatly beloved. Um, when I had a, I, I came back from Vietnam when I was um, 20 years old. Um, I went for the next nine years, I went uh, through tremendous um, stress, PTSD. Uh, I, in Vietnam, I had 864 combat missions on a helicopter. Okay, so I think you can see the stress that that would have caused a 19-year-old kid. Um, so when I got back, when I hit 29, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, and it was a life-shaking moment. I had been a Christian since I was 17, 18. Uh, I became a Christian right before I went to Vietnam. But that verse out of Daniel 9, uh, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and he says, I have come to show you that thou art greatly beloved. So there's no message that the church gives that is more important than that message. I think one thing that I've appreciated about Pastor Bob's preaching is the continuous, I'm a, I'm a knowledge individual, I should say. I, I look at Christianity through knowledge. And Pastor Bob looks at not Christianity through love. And I think that's been very good for me. It's, I know it's been good for me. So he says, uh, thou art greatly beloved. And what we have to learn as Christians, we have to learn that it's not just in the spirit, but it's the body and the soul. Not only are you greatly beloved, but you are saved eternally. Oh, I guess I have the thing, don't I? Let's see. Let's move on. Tonight, we're going to start with Mary Magdalene. A little bit about Mary. I'm sure you've never heard some of this stuff. Um, some of you may have some misconcepts about Mary, uh, the Magdalene, um, but we'll straighten those out tonight. There's six Marys mentioned in the Bible, okay? There's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, there's the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And by the way, Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I mean Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, is one who washes the Lord's feet with her hair. Okay, so that's a confusion point. There's Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, okay, and we'll talk about that in depth. There's the mother of James and Jose, Matthew. There's the mother of John Mark, and there's a Christian lady in Rome who labored in behalf of the congregation there. So Mary is like the name Dave in this church, <laughs> okay. I mean, my goodness, you know, when I first started coming here, the men's thing, it's just easy. If you get lost, you just say, hi, Dave, how you doing? And 50% of the time, you're going to probably be right. Right, Dave? Right, right, Dave? Right, Dave? Yeah, there's three. Is there any more Daves out here tonight? I guess not. Um, so anyway, Mary of Magdala, referred to as Mary Magdalene. We find her mentioned 12 times in the New Testament. That's more times than most of the disciples were mentioned, okay? It's very interesting. And she normally always has that title, Magdalene or Magdala, okay? Was, here's the question. Let's get it out of the way. Was she an evil woman, a temptress, a prostitute, a fallen woman, okay? That is not... Now, the scriptures do say that Jesus cast seven demons from her, okay? 
Now, one thing, and, I've, and we won't get into the theology of demons, etc. here tonight, but for many people, they make the assumption that when the scriptures say that, that these are demonic creatures living within her. But during this time, and you'll see when we look at a verse, they also thought that demon possession was infirmities, okay, sicknesses, etc. So whether she was evil or not, we'll find out. But, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to move yet. Um, we find her mentioned 12 times, okay? Luke points out from where she comes, a sinner saved by grace. Anybody out here tonight that's not a sinner? If so, stand up, come on up, we'd like to meet you. So this woman, by the way, her, the concept of her being evil started around 500 A.D., okay? It was not, the early church did not consider her evil, okay, or a fallen woman. It started under Pope Gregory I, and he was attempting to consolidate the church against the other church. So he didn't want women to have a position in the Catholic Church. So he began this concept. Okay, so anyway, we'll get more to that. A sinner saved by grace. And a certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. You see it there? Oh, I'm sorry, I got my wrong pointer. Infirmities. You know, and I apologize to you folks that are at home, because it's been told me that you can't see my little spotter. So I'm sorry, it's right there. Infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom were seven devils or demons. If you're looking for an argument to make her a bad woman, this is the only place, this verse is the only verse that supports that she might have a problem, okay? And what we're going to look at tonight and further on in our discussion, we're going to look at what we look at is the scriptures. We have to take scripture in context, right? And then we have to take scripture and we have to see if a verse seems odd to us, how does it match up with the other verses or other contexts that we have? If we look into any of our lives, here's the key for tonight. If we look into any of our lives, would we not find a sinner saved by grace? That's us. And so Mary will fit right in with us real easily. Okay, this is a picture of 1910 of Magdala, all right? If you look, and I'm sorry for you folks, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'm not doing this very well tonight. Over here, this is the Sea of Galilee. If you went here today, if, if you go to Magdala today, uh, you can't even see any of that. It's all timber, all the way along the sea here. Over here is the Mount of Beatitudes, my little deal's just losing itself. Over here is the Mount of Beatitudes. Capernaum's over here. And this is where everything happened during Christ's time. And you don't see trees there now. But now, because Israel, the Israel, the Jews, from the, as they came back to Israel, they planted trees everywhere here. So this is what it would have looked similar. That village right there, is probably what it looked like during Christ's time. Okay, it's that simple. Uh, nothing, it may be, this is 100 plus years ago, but if you went back 1900 years, it would probably look very similar. So, this case, she, they believed that she came from this little village. Interesting to me, and, and I, I try to put things together, I was thinking, why the continuous mention of Magdalene? So let's go on, okay? What's so special about Magdala? During the time of Christ, it was a fishing village, okay, that produced a large amount of Israel's salted fish. You think, well, what's the big deal about fish? This little village fed most of the Roman troops that were in the Galilee and everywhere throughout Israel. It held a synagogue 
of tremendous value to archaeologists. In this synagogue was found an amazing stone. And next to this synagogue was found two mikvahs. Now, a mikvah is a pool for ceremonial washing, and we'll talk about that when I show a picture of it. In this synagogue, the Christ had probably spoken. He had probably taken, and I'm going to get into this, the Moses seat, sat on the Moses seat, and was handed the law to read. Okay? And in this mikvah, the Christ probably was made ceremonially clean. So let's start with the mikvah. Uh, went too, too many. Right here. This is what's called a mikvah. This, you can believe this or not, but probably the Christ walked down those stairs, went into the pool, and walked back out the other side. Okay? People say, well, why did he go to Israel? Because there in anywhere else in the world, you can see probably a place that the Christ walked, okay? And that's one of them. 99.9% .9 chance that that happened there. And that's one of the two mikvahs that are there. And a mikvah also had to have living water, okay? It had to have water that flowed all the time. It can't be a stagnant pool. It has to be flowing water. And these mikvahs, both of them, have water sources that allow that. So, let's go on. Let's look at this synagogue. During the time of Christ, it had an amazing artifact of which only one exists. It is a stone with all four sides and the top are carved, and I'll show it to you. This was before the transition from temple worship to synagogue worship. After 70 AD, the Jews went through an amazing time of change and disorientation. If we were to take in America and destroy every church, burn them all to the ground, and you could no longer come to church, okay, what would that be like for us? Well, America's been around since 1776, of 200 and what is that, 46 years. Temple worship for the second temple had been going on now over 570 years, okay? And the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The Jew, okay, was lost, literally, psychologically, physically, spiritually. The Jew was lost. He, um, later on, when in 134 AD, during the Bar Kochka revolt, Hadrian, this incredibly evil emperor of Rome, made it a death warrant to the Jew who just looked towards Jerusalem, okay? You couldn't even, if you were a Jew, you couldn't even look towards Jerusalem. So for this, from 70 AD on, the Jew is lost. So God, in his great mercy, gives them something. No longer able to look to the temple for life-sustaining sacrifices needed for purification and holiness, they were lost spiritually. 500-plus years of temple worship disappeared overnight, okay? Everything they held sacred was lost. They longed for an anchor for their souls. When I had uh, my nervous breakdown, I longed for an anchor for my soul. And I was a Christian. God had carried me through Vietnam. He had carried me through all of these years following that and the, the depression, etc. But I longed for an anchor for my soul. And that's when I read that verse out of Daniel that I am come to show you that you are greatly beloved. So, at Magdala, we see the beginning of a movement away from the temple to the synagogue. This stone that you see right there, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not coordinated tonight. This stone right here, and we'll show another picture of it in a minute, was found right there. That's not the actual stone, by the way. That's a facsimile. The actual stone, I believe, is in Rome right now. 
Uh, but you can see the mosaics that are here. The floor is all rough, etc. This has all been excavated. Uh, this was completely buried, only found when they began to build a hotel here. Okay? That's when they found it. They began to find these, these walls. Uh, immediately they stopped the construction. And now the construction is continuing over here to our right. Uh, but they've completely unearthed this synagogue. This stone found in situ, in situ, for you kids, this is a fancy archaeological term, in situ means in place, okay? It hadn't been moved. You know, when I showed you my cup, I think, did I ever show you my cup that I found? That I found in situ, okay? It was 2,300 years old. Well, this is, it's new compared to my cup. It's 2,000 years old. The stone found in C2 at Magdala gives us a clue to what they wanted to believe in. Once again, it was the temple. Remember last week, I taught you about the temple and the tabernacle? So, this is what it looks like on the one side. What do you have right here? You have the candelabra. You have the uh, seven-fold candelabra that is a symbol of the temple. And then we have the seven-branched candelabra. This, remember when I talked to you last week, we talked about that the priest would enter the tabernacle, the outer court. He would go to the, sacri the altar of sacrifice. Then he would slay the animal, the sacrifice, the blood would be on him. He would walk to the laver. He would wash and be clean. Then he would enter the holy place, and in the holy place, he would eat from the showbread. He would then, from that, he would turn left, and he would go towards this candelabra, okay? And that's why you see this everywhere, okay, in Israel. A lot of archaeological finds. When you can find one of those, you found something else. But you can go in caves and everything and see these carved everywhere. So, once again, it was that man would enter salvation via belief in the temple as his place of refuge. In Beth Shalim, a statement was found that said to be buried in the land of Israel was to be buried under the altar. People say, isn't it unsafe to go to Israel? Now, I've been to Israel nine times. I have never felt unsafe in Israel. And if I did feel unsafe, I would take that verse or that, se that statement to my grave because I would feel like to, if I was to die in Israel, it would be as if I was buried under the altar. And this is not an altar. It's something even more important. Let me show you. Okay? Before I get to there, I want to talk a little bit about this thing called the Moses seat, the seat of Moses. Every synagogue throughout the Jewish world at those days had what's called a Moses seat. The Moses seat, this is the only one that has been found. And this is at a place called Chorazim. Okay? If you go to uh, um, Mandala, it's next to the Sea of Galilee. If you go up the hill, oh, about four miles above the Mount of Beatitudes, you'll come to Chorazim. And Chorazim is burned. When you go there, you can see all the stone has burn marks, everything. Okay? Woe to you. Jesus said this. Woe to you, Chorazim. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. There's two really depressing places to go in Israel. The first is Chorazim, okay? Because the burning, you can see where it was burned so heavily. And Bethsaida, also. I've been to both several times. They're very depressing places because these are places that Jesus did miracles at and the people rejected what he had to say. Not just what he had to say, but they rejected the miracles that he did. So this seat 
in every synagogue would be where the person who had been invited that day to speak, 99.9% of the time a rabbi. So if you'll go to the next one, please. Okay, this is where the stone, now this is a facsimile, this is what that, the synagogue would have looked like, would have had Greek pillars, etc., would have had light coming in, would have had walls all the way around. It would have, this stone was found here in the usual site of a synagogue. Now, this, you've noticed this gentleman is faced this way, and for those of you that are home, he's faced this way. That's east, okay? Every synagogue faces east, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, every synagogue faces Jerusalem, okay? I said that wrong, all right? So if this pastor or rabbi was here kneeling at that stone, why? Because this synagogue, they found no Moses seat. The Moses seat would have sat here, or it would have sat here. But this is what they found here. And this was found, as I said, in situ. Whenever it was destroyed, it was destroyed very rapidly, and everything caved in, and that's why we found it in situ. So archaeologists believe that possibly the Magdala stone was where they placed the Torah as they read it. So you can see this rabbi on his knees reading the Torah. So the usual site, it seems to replace the Moses seat, this stone. Seems to be replacing it. So moving on. I personally believe that they, mistake, they mistook the object lesson for the real thing. Remember last week I talked about that the tabernacle and the temple are object lessons. They're there for us. They are to lead us to the Christ. Uh, remember where Nicodemus, Jesus says to Nicodemus, art thou a teacher of Israel and know not these things? Do you remember that he said that? That's the object lesson. The object lesson is that the temporal and the tabernacle are to lead us to spiritual life. And the tabernacle temple was an object lesson designed to lead men to the knowledge of salvation via the Christ. When the Christ came, they missed this lesson, and the Jews continue to miss it to this day. Now, here's the good news. In Israel today, um, there's a tremendous move among Jews to become Christians. They are opening up. The Jewish population are, they're called Messianic Jews. They are, many are coming to the Lord and believing, okay? Mary and John, back to Mary Magdalene and John the Apostle, found the true object lesson, salvation based on the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They found a love that would carry them forward to what really looks matters to them. Let's look at some verses that we can anchor our souls to within the veil. <clears throat> Last week, this young lady sitting over, was that Jenny? She asked a question. Jeanette, okay. Jeanette, she's not here tonight. Okay. She asked a question about eternal security. And I thought, you know, I knew exactly the section that she's talking about where she got her quiz from. But, and she wasn't being negative. No, if those of you that are watching at home, she was just, it was a very good question. Okay? So I went this week, and I began to dig up some verses. Um, and it's kind of fascinating. Uh, I found over 100 of them, okay? But I just want to read a few uh, to settle this anchor within the veil. And do you know what I mean by the veil? Okay, the temple, you had the holy place, and then you had the, the priest would go to the table of showbread, he, bread, he'd go to the candelabra, then he would go to the altar of incense, and then and only then he would pull, pull the veil away, and he once a year, carrying the blood, he would enter the holy of holies, 
and there he would put the blood on the altar. Okay? So that's within the veil. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. There's a, people always thinking, well, gee, I can lose my salvation. Uh, let's just read some verses. Verse 637, John. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. One of the reasons I had this tremendous breakdown in my life was because of what I had done in Vietnam as a gunner on a helicopter. What I had done, I had this horrendous guilt. Horrendous guilt. Because I had killed it, I'd, I'd shot and killed people. I had this horrible guilt. And it just lived with me. It ate me alive every day, every day. And it says right here, I will never cast out, John 6, 37. God came to me on the, and he said that thou art greatly beloved and I will never cast you out. 10, 28, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you're sitting out here tonight, no one can snatch you, Satan, no one can snatch you out of God's hands. Truly, truly, John 5, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. For God, you know, all know, you should be memorized this, you young children, everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 8, 38. And by the way, these two young boys can really read. They're him and him, I think. Weren't they at the breakfast the other day? Man, they can read. I wish I could read like that when I was a kid. For I am sure that neither death nor life, one of my favorite verses, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The summer before last, and I believe August, um, I died. Okay, It's kind of interesting. I was in an emergency room, my heart for about four hours. I have AFib and what's called a flutter. My heart had been going about 180 beats, and it had been doing that for four or five hours, and when I got to the uh, my doctor's office, the nurse panicked when she took my pulse, and uh, the doctor walked in, and he says, just roll him over to uh, emergency here at McKee, because the, the, the cardiologist's office was here. He says, roll him over there, put him in a wheelchair and get him over there. They put me in. I was laying there. Jewel was with me, my wife, and she's not feeling well tonight. She was sitting next to me or standing there, it was happening so fast, everything. All these nurses and doctors were gathered around. And I remember witnessing to the nurse. I remember saying it. And I'm not a big witness, guys. I'm a teacher. I can talk all day long about Jesus in front of a group like this. But to do like Pastor Dave does and go out on the street, that would terrify me. Okay? It really would. But this... For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things present. As I laid there, I looked up and I was talking to the nurse. And she says, you're going to be okay. And I said, yeah, I'm going to be okay. Because I got Jesus living within me. And I closed my eyes. And they began to, they're getting ready to shock me. They're what's called a cardioversion. And it was my sixth cardioversion. And my heart stopped. And the whole room, my wife said, the whole room panicked, okay? But I had just got done telling her, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor anything can separate me from the love of Christ. That's how secure we are. That's how we have victory over death. We are secure you choose to believe that or you don't. But you know what? If you're lucky and you live to be my age and you're still alive and halfway healthy, 
Um, maybe you'll experience that a few times in your life. I did many times on that helicopter in Vietnam. Okay? Uh, more and more verses. I'm not going to spend them all because I want to get back to Mary Magdalene. But if you want, I can certainly get you these. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Okay? Um, Ephesians 4. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If you go to Ephesus, where Paul uh, wrote the book of, or the letter to the Ephesians, it's, there's a real, I'll give you a sidebar, this is a sidebar. Um, you, can dia, you can diagram the book of Ephesians in three words. Sit, walk, stand. Okay? We sit with Christ in the heavenlies, we walk with Christ on the earth, and we stand with him against Satan. But what's the first word? word? We sit, we sit with Christ in the heavenlies, do you know what the heavenlies were? People immediately think we're sitting with Christ in heaven. No. It, has anybody, you've been to Ephesus, right? No, Linda? No. Okay. When you walk up um, Palisade Street in Ephesus, you come to a statue. And it's the statue of Hercules. This, you've all heard the story of Hercules. Okay? And as you walk beyond that statue... I and about a million other visitors to Ephesus have done something that most men could never have done during Paul's day. Because I entered the part of Ephesus that was called the heavenlies. And Paul, when he makes the statement, we sit with Christ in the heavenlies, he's saying we Christians have passed through the gates of Hades, and we now sit, uh, the gates of Hercules, I knew I'd said something wrong, and we now sit where only kings and princes and royalty sit. That's who you and I are. We are royalty. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You know, you've been sealed. I've been sealed. Uh -oh. Okay, let's go. Mary and John found the true object lesson. Salvation based, oh, keep moving one more little bit. I jumped ahead, there we go. Salvation, you guys do a great job, by the way, thank you. Salvation based on the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These two people are found in a place that really matters. Remember that Mary was mentioned 12 times? What's the first place that she's mentioned? It says something about she has seven demons. Okay, that's it. Now let's look at what it says. Mary the sinner, Luke 8, 2. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary Magdalene, out of whom came seven demons. Mary at the crucifixion, John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. There was also another person there, very prominent individual. John, the apostle, was there also watching this. Both of them, both of them in church history are referred to as having been greatly beloved. All right, Matthew 27, 56, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Mary the mother and the mother of Zebedee's children. Mark 15, 40, there were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene, all present at the crucifixion. Now Mary at the tomb, Mark 16, 1, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought, brought, it should be brought, not bought, sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. When they did a funeral in Israel, okay, they did not embalm the body. They didn't pull all the blood out and embalm the body. They laid the body flat 
okay? On normally, if they could get it, a marble slab. I think I showed you that marble slab a couple weeks ago. Uh, they would lay them on a marble slab, and then they would wrap the body with spices and herbs, etc. Then they would lay them in the sepulcher. And there was Mary Magdalene, 2761, and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. And sepulcher is just another word for the tomb. And Mark 15, 47, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, I, I can't say that word, Hoses, beheld where he was laid. So they're at the tomb. Mary, we see, is a sinful woman saved by grace. She's at the crucifixion. She's at the tomb, and she's at, at Easter morning. Mark 28, 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now, those of you that know the scriptures know that I'm skipping a great deal of reading involved here. Okay, there's a whole lot of um, items that go into this. I've also, for your benefit, I've rearranged how these verses go so you kind of see a syntax of how they should be coming, you know, at the tomb to the next morning. John 20, verse 1. The first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and sees the stone was taken away from the sepulcher. In Mark 16, 9, now, when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons or devils. Fascinating that the first person he appears to is a woman, okay? Mary is also referred to in church history as the apostle to the apostles, okay? And I'll explain that in a minute. But she's the first to see the risen Christ. And if you know the stories, uh, she says, where have you taken him? There's two men sitting in the sepulcher, etc. And she says these statements. And then she walks out and she sees a man she thinks is the gardener. And that's the Christ. And he's risen. She can't touch him yet. So she's the first to see him. Who's the second person to reach the tomb. Anybody? John, the beloved disciple. Then who beats John into the tomb? Peter. Okay, good. Got that. All right. So out of whom he had cast seven demons. Mary tells the disciples, Luke 24, 10. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things to the apostles. And in John 20, 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. What an amazing woman. You know, we as uh, Christians, uh, hopefully we look at women as equals in the faith. My wife is by, she's not here so I can talk about her, my wife is by far more learned in the scriptures than I am. She's, she's been a Christian her entire life. She can't remember when she wasn't a Christian. She was raised in a Christian home. Her grandparents were China missionaries for 40 years. Her father was a Japanese missionary for 20 years and a pastor the rest of his life. In fact, my wife's mother just died this week, um, Monday uh, we got the news. She was um, quite a lady. Um, I can tell you, if you could aspire to being the Christian woman of incredible dignity and calm and love, then you would be looking at my mother-in-law. And my mother-in-law, I was telling the guys the other day, when she was well in her 90s, she's 96 when she passed away this week, when she was in her 90s, she was memorizing scripture. Okay, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, I have trouble memorizing. I've got a lot of scripture memorized, but I don't do a lot of scripture memory work now. Okay, I, this brain's pretty well gone, I think. So, Mary, but my mother-in-law personified all of that 
And we need as men in the church, uh, another thing I really like about this church, what's drawn me to this church has been, it's got a strong male base, okay? It's got men that are showing up for meetings and being there every time the church doors are open. There's men there. I, I've had the, the great blessing of being able to come Tuesday morning and, and chit, just sit around and chit-chat with the guys. And then Saturday mornings at the breakfast, that's a very special time. So, And you ladies, I'm sure, have the same kind of things in this particular church. So, the Apostle John. Let's look at his life. Now, you're going to say, how are you going to cover John's life in about 10 minutes? <laughs> okay. Well, we will. Oh, and by the way, I'm backing up. Once again, that's another picture of the Magdala stone. Okay, John's a little bit different. Let's look at him. John, the one who Christ loved. All right, how would you... I, I always think, how would you like that title? The one that Christ loved. Well, guess what? If you got Christ living in you here tonight... You've got that title. We have that title. The one that Christ loved. So we first see John as a young disciple of John the Baptist. Okay, John's out in the wilderness down uh, by Jericho. And he's down there and he's um, baptizing in the Jordan. Uh, two years ago I had the joy of baptizing a lady with us. She said, Larry, would you baptize me? And I'm not a pastor, but it didn't matter. Uh, so I said, come on in. And the water was icy cold. It's, it was snow melt coming down um, the Jordan. And she wrote me this wonderful letter when we got back. And she said it was the highlight of her trip. And I'd hope so. Being baptized in the Jordan River. Probably at the same place or very close to where Christ was. And shortly thereafter, he's called by Christ to be a disciple. Up on the Galilee. Okay, up on the Sea of Galilee. Soon he becomes one of the inner three and is listed with Peter and James, okay? He is referred to as the beloved one at the Last Supper. We talked about the Last Supper. We talked about how he would have been the one, the honored guest. He was the one honored guest, Christ. The second honored guest was Judas, okay? The one honored guest knew who his Savior was. He looked at him and he called him Lord, the other honored guest called him rabbi. In other words, the one knew who his Lord was, the one knew his teacher was. Shortly, soon he becomes one of the, okay, he is referred to as beloved one at the Last Supper. Even Peter, even the great apostle Peter, and by the way, what do I mean when I say apostle? Okay, it says in Ephesians that he gave some apostles and prophets and pastors and evangelists and teachers, okay? It says that. It says apostle. What do you think the word apostle really denotes? In their day and age, an apostle was one who had seen the risen Christ. Okay? He or she had seen the risen Christ. Now, in modern context, we've taken it down, and the terminology used for apostle tends to point towards one who speaks forth the word of truth. Okay, Dr. Hawking out of Longmont, uh, when he teaches his spiritual gifts, he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. And those four, or those five, however you want to look at it, four or five gifted ones to the church. Okay? So, he's referred to, he stays with that Christ that night in the garden and the trials, and he's present at the crucifixion. He is given the responsibility of watching out for Mary, the mother of Christ. And when I get all done here, I'm going to show you a picture of where they believe possibly John was buried in Turkey, just outside of Ephesus. And I'll show you that when we get done. He's given the responsibility of watching out for Mary, the mother of Christ. Church history tends to tell us that John, Paul was in Ephesus. Later in his life, John, with Mary, the mother of Christ, went to Ephesus. Okay? The Catholic Church teaches, 
And when you go there to Ephesus, and this is kind of interesting, I don't have the picture anymore, I would certainly show it. Um, this is, I went to Ephesus before we had these awesome iPhones and cameras that we have today, okay? But I went to what's called Mary's house, okay? And Mary's house, a little stone house, about like what you saw in the other picture there in Magdala, little stone house, and when I took a picture of it with a regular camera, it kept it was, I got the film, right? I mean, it wasn't film, but it was a digital camera. I kept getting it, and it had light, the whole burst of light coming from it. And I took another one, and there's this burst of light. And I'm thinking, wow, this must be Mary's house. This must have been where Mary, the mother of Christ, lived. But anyway, just a little sidebar there. He's the first disciple, but anyway, his job, his job was to take care of Mary the mother of Christ. Okay, we do not look at Mary the way that a Catholic would look at her, but we do have to respect and honor this incredible woman of God, okay? He is the first disciple to arrive at the tomb on resurrection morning. He sees the risen Lord after the resurrection, qualifying him for apostleship. He writes the Gospel of John, 1 and 2 John, and the revelation. He is the only disciple not martyred according to church history. He lived till he was probably in his 90s, all right? And that's when he did the revelation. He is the only, okay, not martyred. Uh, if you ever want to read some interesting history, read how they think that the early fathers, the early disciples were martyred. Each one is very unique, etc. He ends his life living in Ephesus, and Mary appears to be with him in Ephesus. His depth of knowledge in the love of Jesus is amazing. What's, I, I, maybe I've given this away before. What's the greatest song in Christendom? I heard a sermon on this. Pastor, if you ever want sermon material, this is it right here. You heard it from God's lips. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Probably one of the greatest sermons I ever in my life heard was a pastor preaching through that song. That's why we're here, guys. There isn't any other reason. I, I, I just really don't believe it. We're here to experience the love of God. And he doesn't, his depth of knowledge in the love of Jesus is amazing. He doesn't focus on doctrine as much as living the walk. He becomes a leader in the early church. He, of all the disciples, to seems to be the most devoted. Uh, this is why when the pastor was talking this morning about the Gospel of John, if you're here or you're listening and you want to know a basis for your Christianity, you want to know how to get closer and walk better, study the Gospel of John, Okay? Take, and you know what's so unique? You know, you have the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or what are called synoptic gospels. John is, sits in its own realm. And what John does, the first 13 chapters of John deal with the public ministry of the Christ. Okay? After that, it deals with the private ministry to the disciples. So John, through the Holy Spirit, as he's writing these stories down... He starts by telling you about all these people, 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 uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, John, the blind man of John, the, the lame man of Bethesda. He goes on the, the um, healed, la the uh, lepers that were healed. He tells you all these stories of people. And you know what? If you study those stories, if you study those stories, guess what you're going to find in them? You're going to find you somewhere in one of those stories. You're going to find you, and you're going to be amazed how much God loves you. And that's why I believe John's depth of knowledge was amazing. He becomes a leader. He, of all the disciples, to be, seems to be the most devoted. He writes the letters to the seven churches and has tremendous authority over them. In Revelation, you deal with... Um, the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, 
okay? And John just hammers. I, I've, I'm sure this church has done the study of the Revelation and done the study on the seven churches and the, the letters, but under the church of the Laodiceans write, I know, um, I know that thou art neither hot nor cold, but thou art lukewarm. You know what? Are we lukewarm? I'm lukewarm quite regularly. You know, I think it's, uh, people see the side of me that's up here with, with Bible knowledge and teaching and whatnot. But when I leave here, it's weird because I'm just a regular Joe when I leave here. Bob's just a regular Joe. Pastor Dave, he's a little bit more than a regular Joe. But, but no, I mean, he's amazing, okay? He writes the letter to the seven churches. They're worth studying. Uh, and then you can get into the rest of it. He has visions of the last days. He sees the rapture of the church. He sees the wrath of God poured out on man and Satan. Uh, he waits the second coming of the Christ with total abandon. Uh, the Jews believe that the Christ, the early church believed that the Christ would return down past the Mount of Olives and he would come to the eastern gate, okay, and he would enter through the eastern gate. I've done something that most uh, very few Christians have ever been allowed to do. When I was in Jerusalem one time, it was early in the morning, and I had got onto the Temple Mount, and there's the walls, and here's the eastern gate, and I actually went up on the eastern gate, okay, on the top of it. And immediately the waf, that's the Arab, uh, the Muslim police, came from both sides and they were screaming at me to get off of the eastern gate. No one's allowed. Because why? Because the Christ is going to come through that gate when he returns. And this is what the apostle John saw. He awaits that second com coming. And he ends the New Testament with the words, surely, Jesus saying, surely I come quickly, amen. And John says, even so, Lord Jesus, come. And that's what you and I should be waiting for, the come. Okay, this is the tomb of John the Apostle. Probably, we just, you know, once again, we don't know. but we, And this is just outside of Ephesus, um, and so it very well could be where the John was buried. Um, thoughts, comments, or questions? I always like to end with, how, anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions? No, the, the guards on the Temple Mount are all Arab Muslim. Jews do not go on the Temple Mount, okay? The chief rabbi of the city of Jerusalem has forbid Jews from entering the Temple Mount ever, okay? Uh, remember when I was talking about the Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall and the what's called the Herodian Tunnels? You can walk along there and you'll see these women standing there praying and they're knocking their head against the wall. They're praying like this. Well, they're not in or on the Temple Mount. They're outside the Temple Mount, but they're as close as they could be to the Holy of Holies. That's the closest place that a Jew can come to the Temple Mount. Not that Jews don't go up there. It's just that they're forbidden to. Uh, no rabbi, well, I can't say that because I've been with a rabbi that went up there, but the Jews tend to not go to the Temple Mount. No, they don't. Um, they're not allowed up there. The guard that's up there are what are called the waf, okay? And the waf is the Muslims control the Temple Mount. The Jews control outside the Temple Mount, okay? And that's, that's how it's just divided up. It's been that way since 1967, the war there. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes. Uh, 
Well, my wife would love me to teach on the Revelation. I've never, I, I've taught on the seven churches. I'm, I, I've just, I've never really taught. My father-in-law, who was a pastor, taught the most fascinating of the Revelation. Pastor, have you taught the Revelation in the church? Yeah, so, yeah. It's on your, web, he says it's on their website too. There's a lot of debate, just the rapture alone, you know. Um, I'm a, uh, you know, you have amillennialists, premillennialists, if you know that terminology, I'm seeing some blank looks. I'm a panmillennialist, okay? I believe it's going to pan out in the end. And you know what? It's right there. It's right on that verse that I was looking at a minute ago. It's, come Lord Jesus. You know, if I'm here and I'm raptured, good look, praise the Lord for me. And I hope that it goes that way. I hope the rapture is first, okay? But you know what? God's going to pan it out anyway. That's a, that's a pan-millennialist, if you want to know that terminology. Be yeah, be ready. Well, you know what? Even that concept, Pastor Dave, is, is kind of, if I beg to differ, we're already ready. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is what makes you ready for the rapture, okay? It's nothing that I do. It's nothing that you do that gets you ready for the rep tribula or to the rapture. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But you should be moving forward towards the Christ in your walk. And I think that's what you were trying to say. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Thoughts, comments, questions? Quiet group tonight. Um, interesting stuff, though, isn't it? Um, I think that I just want to say thank you to each of you that's come out diligently for these weeks. Um, I love to teach. I would like to see, Pastor Bob kept alluding this morning, and I kept hearing it, hearing it, um, I've been an adult teacher for years and years. I'm a big believer in adult education because I think that once we get our adults educated, and not that sermons aren't education, but I'm talking actual teaching similar to what this is. Um, that's what I do. Um, I got to tell you guys too, you need to really appreciate your pastor because I work... Um, people don't realize how much I work on one of these lessons. I probably work 30 hours a week to get a lesson like this ready. And if I know the material and I've taught it before, I probably only work 20 hours a week to do that, okay? But I can't imagine week, and I would like to teach about six weeks at a time, okay? I, I found that after six weeks, I start to, to lose it, okay? Okay. Um, I can't imagine getting up here and preaching week after week after week after week. It, it's mind-boggling to me. I watched my father-in-law preach year in and year out. So you need to really hold up and honor your pastors and, and all of your staff that are on this church, the people that are making this happen, that are making all of this come to be. Uh, this young lady, and I don't even know your name, the music today was just phenomenal. I thought your singing was beautiful. Um, in fact, we'll let you do. Let's close in prayer. We'll listen to her sing and these guys. It's a beautiful song. Dear Lord, we just thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for Mary of Magdala. Mary Magdalene, Lord. Someone who was always at your side. Someone who you saved and you loved to the end. And Lord, we thank you for John, the apostle, this young man who saw the Savior, walked with him his entire life, and went on to be with him. And Lord, we just pray for each member of this church tonight, Lord, that you would be with them, that your spirit would be in them, that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they are saved. And Lord, we just ask that you'd be with this church, keep this church growing, keep the people coming. And we'll just give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Larry.